Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing Venezuela and sanctions and immigration with Adrian Pine, visiting professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies, Department of Anthropology and Social Change, and co-editor of Asylum for Sale, Profit and Protest in the Migration Industry. Adrian Pine, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks so much for having me, David. Great to be here. Thanks for coming on. Lots to talk about. The The U.S. government is illegally punishing people in Venezuela and in Cuba and dozens of other countries. And then members of the U.S. government are getting upset when some of those suffering people try to emigrate to the United States. Do I have that right? Well, you have that right. Um, uh, and the and yet also that when they get upset, they articulate it in a way that completely erases the fact that the U.S. has the almost entire responsibility for the large numbers of Venezuelan and Cuban and Nicaraguan immigrants that we're seeing at this moment. It's the economic warfare that they're carrying out that has forced people to, to leave their homes, their communities, their families. Um, and yet what we hear from the United States government and its stenographers in the mainstream media is that these people are fleeing dictatorship. If you look at the statistics um, in Venezuela, for example, up until 2015, that was a net emigrant rece uh, migrant receiving country. So people were migrating toward Venezuela because it is a very prosperous country. It has the largest reserves of oil in the world, and it has tremendous um, social programs that really are, are beneficial to people. So people are migrating to Venezuela. What happens in 2015? Obama begins the implementation of what are now 900 separate unilateral coercive measures against that country, which serves as an economic warfare. It strangles the population. It's meant as collective punishment for countries that choose to another path apart from neoliberal fascism that the US is exporting. And that means that people then become impoverished. They you know, lose access to the great healthcare and all the other things that they had before. And it's because of that that they're leaving. So you know, statistically, it's very clear that the emigration is directly linked to these sanctions for these countries. If you legitimately thought a country's government had problems, uh, why would further punishing the people who live there be a useful step unless the goal is to overthrow the government? Is that the goal? And if so, but, does, does sanctions ever actually accomplish the goal? The explicit goal is to overthrow the government. The US officials are, are very explicit in that. Um, and yet, if these governments are so bad and uh, so unpopular, then why doesn't the, the United States just let them fail on their own? And the reason, of course, is that they're not unpopular and they're not doing bad things. They're doing things that the United States doesn't like, like, like uh, provide education and health care as human rights as opposed to commodities to like, you know, ensuring that nobody is. Living, living in abject poverty, that nobody is on the streets, the things that the United States doesn't like other countries to do because, frankly, there's there's money to be made in, in impoverishing other countries and their populations. So that's the actual motivation rather than taking offense at a dictatorship. Uh, is there, by the way, a dictatorship? In, in Venezuela, uh, well, I mean, in any of these countries, the fact is that these countries have thriving democracies. I've been to, I've witnessed um, at this point two separate visit Venezuelan large-scale elections, a presidential election and then a, a regional election. Um, and I have to concur with the Carter Center, which um, called Venezuelan's election system the most transparent in the world and the fairest in the world. Um, there are multiple redundancies there's both electronic and paper ballots. Everybody has a receipt from what they voted. It's it's just, it's and it's universal. It's not, you know, what we have here, a state by state system where everybody's contesting the ballots. It's, it's, it's an incredibly 
transparent and democratic system. And the fact is that, you know, in some elections, the opposition has won. In some elections, the, you know, the, um, the PSUV, which is the party of Hugo Chavez has won. They've always they've had the presidency since since uh, since Chavez first came to power, um, and that's because they're tremendously popular. So um, just uh, recently at the South American summit that was held in Brazil, where um, leaders from all the South American countries, presidents from all. Uh, except for Peru, where the um, where Dina Boluarte, who is currently in what some might call a you know occupying a sort of coup position as as president, but in any case, you know certainly she was not elected to president. Um, she was not permitted by her Congress to go, but they did send a high level official. And um, so, excuse me about this. Um, turning off my phone here. <laughs> um, so uh, le leaders from all South American countries were there. Even the right wing leaders, everybody made very clear that Venezuela, they consider Venezuela a true democracy, an example of democracy. Even the presidents, again, who don't like Maduro. Um, and I think that's what we need to understand in the United States. Our government and our media is going to repeat over and over again until people believe that it's a dictatorship. But the fact is, it's a democratically elected and very popular government. So President Obama put these sanctions in place. Uh, and since his time, we've gone through President Trump, a Republican presidency, and then back to President Biden, a Democratic presidency. These people, we are told routinely by U.S. infotainment media, disagree completely with each other on everything. So presumably the sanctions all went away and became flowers and roses and then went back uh, to being sanct. What's the what's the story over time here? Um, you know, the sanctions have been in place consistently consistently since 2015. And um, and it's really it's things have just been getting worse and worse and worse um, for Venezuelans. Well, they were for several years. What I should mention is that actually in recent years, in response to the um, really the the incredible harm, and this includes hundreds of thousands of excess deaths in Venezuela. This is something that has been calculated by the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR, in 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 various reports that they've done um what the venezuelan government has done is to first of all start a, a food assistance program that goes to all venezuelans every venezuelan gets um one of these uh one of these packages of food every month um and even opposition figures have openly stated that this has averted a famine in venezuela and then secondly well actually there's three things secondly venezuela has worked very hard on achieving food sovereignty. So they've realized, they've recognized that this economic war um, led by the United States is, is not going to stop anytime soon. And so they have been working to, um, to create stronger agriculture for domestic consumption. And then I think the third thing that's really important that we're seeing is that countries that are sanctioned around the world are starting to ally much more closely with each other so that they can survive this incredible anti-democratic um, violence that the United States is, um, it, this warfare, this form of warfare that the United States is carrying out against countries. So we see Iran, for example, and Venezuela coming into agreement so that, so that they can um, share resources um, that they need. There's uh, Bolivia and Venezuela. And of course, recently with this South American summit, in Brazil, you even see um, uh, President Lula of Brazil uh, suggested that Venezuela should enter the BRICS coalition, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Um, and that uh, that uh, proposal has already been warmly received by several of those countries that make up that, that coalition. Um, and uh, and so this solidarity, this multilateral solidarity that Venezuela is seeing is actually enabling Venezuelans to survive um, to survive the sanctions much better than they would have if they were on their own. One other thing I should add is that many of the people who are coming to the border today who are Venezuelan have actually already spent a couple years in South American countries. Um, 
having migrated in the earlier years of the um, of the implementation of these unilateral coercive measures, and, and you know, in part because there is so much rhetoric in the United States about Maduro being a dictator, they wrongly got the message that they would be welcomed here as refugees. And instead, of course, what's happening is that Biden's policies at the border are as bad or worse than those of Donald Trump in terms of refusing entry to people who they themselves are using as propaganda tools against the um, against the Maduro government. So the sanctions have remained in place and the policies on turning people away at the border have gotten worse despite using those very people as propaganda. Exactly. Incredible. Um, and. The, this impact of incredible suffering and hundreds of thousands of deaths, this also is explicitly intentional, right? Which, I mean, we have U.S. officials talking about how sanctions on various countries are supposed to do this, right? Yeah. And uh, you look at Cuba, for example. I mean, they're, they're going on 61 years of sanctions, um, and always with the express intent of overthrowing the government. And this is tremendous collective punishment against people that the U.S. in doing this states that they're in solidarity with. It's absurd and it's impossible to overstate the cruelty of these sanctions. For example, the United States prevented Cuba, a country that developed on its own because of its incredible scientific uh, community, it developed five original vaccines against the COVID coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, um, the United States prevented other countries from shipping them syringes to be able to administer those vaccines. Untold numbers of Cubans died because the United States prevented syringes and oxygen from reaching the island. Same thing with Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela had paid in many millions of dollars to the COVAX mechanism, which was a mechanism by which um, countries around the world were going to be guaranteed to receive vaccines once they became available. The United States blocked Venezuela from having access to those vaccines that it had paid, that it had already um, invested in. And, and that's, you know, that's not punishing the government. That is killing people. That is no different from hot war. It's it's mass punishment. It's a violation of the Geneva Conventions. It's a crime, right? I I agree with you that that's what it is. Yeah. So it's so it's not legal. It's not moral. Uh, is it democratically decided upon? Do the U does the U.S. public ever decide we want to starve this country and this country and these three dozen countries? When when did I ever have a say in this? I've never seen it put to a vote. And yet that's the thing. In the United States, we have this idea that we have democracy when really what we have is a corporate appointed representative government um, that then acts on behalf of empire. We have bipartisan empire in the United States. And, you know, I mean, and, and it's really um, outrageous because sanctions are the most anti-democratic thing that we could possibly impose. They're preventing countries from democratically deciding what path they want to take for their own people, for their own communities. And that's, um, you know, I mean, and so we say we're exporting democracy. What we're really exporting is impoverishment, and um, and what I and other scholars, a number of other scholars, refer to as neoliberal fascism. In other words, we're exporting a form of fascism that it mirrors, uh, structurally mirrors, sort of classical fascism. In that, you know, there's a tremendous repression of dis dissent, repression of free thought, repression of any sort of democratic processes. Um, uh, xenophobia, militarization, all of these things that go along with classical fascism, but we're implementing them through neoliberal policies, right? So that goes through international financial institutions that the U.S. largely controls, like the World Bank and the IMF, which demand of countries in return for loans that they suspend democracy demands that they suspend labor rights. It demands they suspend environmental rights. These are things that people decide upon democratically and the IMF and World Bank 
which the United States largely controls, is preventing people from having that democracy. So we're exporting not democracy, but neoliberal fascism around the world. And, and when countries don't accept it, then we are going to war against them, both hot and cold, cold, you know, cold in the form of these sanctions, which in fact kill. In, in this excuse, this justification, whether anybody actually believes it or not, of overthrowing a government, it doesn't happen. Uh, you have sanctions for decades, for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, and no government gets overthrown. So it's hard to believe that anybody actually believes that. There has to be some other intention. Uh, but of course, in the case of Venezuela, it hasn't just been sanctions. It's been coup attempts. It's been the import of, of phony presidents, right? Well, and that, of course, that's true. That's true in just about any sanctioned country. The United States is trying unilateral coercive measures, but at the same time, it is engaged in counterinsurgency efforts on all fronts. So you have seen, we have seen this uh, ridiculous coup attempt where Juan Guaido hired a U.S. Merc based mercenary firm and tried to, you know, get these mercenaries to go in on a boat. They were going to kill the president. And I mean, they, they got captured by some fishermen who were like, you know, who are these weird gringos invading our territory? I mean, just local fishermen from a small town who said, no, you're not going to come in and harm our country and our communities and, you know, everything we as Venezuelans have fought so hard to achieve. Um, and, you know, and that's the level of faith that Maduro has in the loyalty of Venezuelans is such that he has actually, um, and I'm not saying this as a proponent of it or, or anything, but he has actually provided arms, weapons to millions of people to be the sort of like defense committees of Venezuela um, against any possible US in led invasion. And I mean, you have to really trust the population if you are going to arm it um, as, uh, you know, a a as a militia, as a citizen militia. I think if, if the biggest advocates of attacking Venezuela in the United States heard what you just said, that this is the country giving everybody guns, they would be the biggest opponents. They might even actually move there. <laughs> you know, it's funny that um, this country, uh, you know, I'm we're in Washington, I'm in Washington. Um, it's an upside down world here. I mean, you go uh, Juan Guaido illegally crossed the Vene Venezuela Colombia border. He snuck out of the country because he does have um, legal proceedings against him for usur for attempted usurpation. Of course, he attempted um, to carry out a coup against the elected president um, and of, of, of Venezuela in early 2019, uh, never actually succeeded in getting any power. But the United States, which was leading the whole operation, um, managed to get you know quite a few countries to recognize him as president. And then you know over the years, it just became ridiculous, like uh, apparent what a farce it was to call this man president, the United States is still calling, you know, they're still saying he was interim president, despite the fact that um, some months ago, even the, the last remaining folks in Venezuela who had supported him um, officially declared that he didn't represent anything anymore. Um, and so, you know, he's got these proceedings against him in Venezuela for, um, for you know, for, for basically for trying to carry out a coup. Um, nobody's arrested him. It's been two years since they started. I mean, they've got the due process in Venezuela. He claimed that he was being persecuted. He snuck across the border and tried to go to this conference that Gustavo Petro, the uh, president of Colombia, had organized with the Venezuelan opposition, the legitimate Venezuelan opposition that kicked Guaido out. Um, and it's a large coalition of people who don't like Maduro. And they're, he's trying to create talks so there can be some sort of reconciliation in Venezuela. Guaido shows up to this conference completely uninvited, gets kicked out of the conference, and then flies to Miami. And then the subsequent week, this is um, in early May, basically was invited to a little a talking head tour of all of the major um, think tanks in Washington. So, you know, I mean, he went to the Wilson Center where he was feted as this you know, beacon of democracy and 
um, you know, and, and like all of the same talking points we heard in 2019. And Washington just lives this fantasy world um, where they think anybody else is going to believe them in the world. And it, it's absurd to watch. There's a school called George Washington University about three blocks from the White House that once graduated a dictator of South Korea, and I don't know how many others over the years, but how proud are they? Uh, do they advertise that they have alumni who they set up as, as presidents of, of selected countries? You know, like whether we're talking about GW or Georgetown or American University, where I unfortunately taught for 12 years and was, a, you know, or like these universities are centers of right wing propaganda, in particular, their Latin American, their Latin America departments, right? So you might have one or two two little token leftist professors there, but they're bringing in um, as sort of distinguished visiting professors, people like Alvaro Uribe, who was a visiting professor at Georgetown right after you know, his dictatorship ended, bringing in people like Roberto Flores Bermudez, who was the ambassador for Micheletti, the, the coup monger who um, in 2009, um, who illegally took power once they kicked out Mel Celaya in Honduras. I mean, that was, so you see this pattern of, of bringing in, not just bringing in, but celebrating dictators, genocidaires, um, you know, and, and then and then it happens with private institutions as well. I mean, the, the Holocaust Museum has Elliot Abrams on its anti-genocide board. This man is a genocidaire. He was the biggest supporter of Rios Montt in Guatemala. Um, he worked to, to, you know, murder as many people as he could in Central America in the 80s. And he is being sort of put forward again by Washington as some sort of human rights representative. And, and all of these universities do this. They're all they're about power and money. There's there's no accountability. There's no intellectual accountability um, at all. It's it's tragic. It's why one of the main reasons why I had to leave academia, because it was um, ethically unsustainable. We are speaking with Adrian Pine, who is a visiting professor at the uh presumably better institution, the California Institute of Integral Studies, uh, Department of Anthropology and Social Change, and co-editor of- Where I'm delighted to be. <laughs> yes, I understand. Sorry. Very good. Uh, people should check it out, the California Institute for, of Integral Studies. Uh, and Adrian is co-editor of Asylum for Sale, Profit and Protest in the Migration Industry. Can you tell us about Asylum for Sale? Sure. Um, asylum for sale. The basic premise of asylum for sale is that um, is that migration and asylum in particular is is a money making industry. I mean, and, and capitalism is what drives it's what drives people to leave their communities in search of asylum in the first place. And as we've already talked about here, a large part U.S. foreign policy driven by capitalism is what's forcing people to leave their countries whether it's forcing people from friendly governments like Honduras under Juan Orlando Hernandez or enemy governments like, like uh, Venezuela under Maduro, um, it's US foreign policy. Uh, so it's capitalism is driving people to leave their countries, but then there are uh, these cynical opportunities for profit at every step of the way, you know, whether you're talking about coyotes, people who are involved in human trafficking, in people's journey um, across borders um, or, or toward, toward countries, toward their destination countries. Um, and then, uh, and then at the borders and, uh, you know, you've got detention center, you've got centers, you've got billions of dollars of, of private, public private funding, you know, going into monitoring, into the development of things like the CBP-1 app, which is what um, people at the, at the U.S.-Mexico border are now forced to use this this app that um, you know is intrinsically racist and that it's only available in three languages and it uses facial recognition technology that doesn't work on black people um, and you know and and people have to have access to a cell phone and all this so that you know there's money somebody's making money off of that and then in 
once people, if they get to their destination country, let's say that's the United States, obviously this is true anywhere else in the world as well, but once they get there, people don't have equal access to asylum. If you have money, you're gonna have a much better chance at getting asylum because you're gonna be able to pay for a lawyer. You're gonna be able to pay for experts. You're gonna be able to get those medical checkups that you need in order to demonstrate that you are a legitimate asylum applicant. People who are impoverished, who are fleeing, um, you know, who are the, the most vulnerable of, Victim, uh, victims of the sorts of violence that force people to flee, they don't have access to asylum unless they are really lucky and, you know, some NGO takes them on. But even then, the NGOs re re rely on donations from, you know, the Ford Foundation or, or whatever large capitalist organization we're talking about. So trying to reframe asylum and ensure that people understand that this is a project of capitalism, not a sort of abstract project of human rights and sort of suffering victims. Uh, Adrian Pine, we have just a few minutes left. What if you were to take all the money that goes into training the soldiers in Latin America and coup attempts and closing the border and everything you just listed, uh, and put it into simple humanitarian aid uh, to other countries, how far would it go? Well, first of all, what I'd like to say is we always have to be really careful about humanitarian aid because what the United States calls humanitarian aid often is actually um, support for the military, the repressive military. And I, I mean, so, okay. actual humanitarian <laughs> aid. I, I know the United States uses that term differently from other countries. So. Right. I, I mean, what, what I would say is that even if we even if we didn't put that money into humanitarian aid, if we just stopped intervening in other countries' democracies, we would see the flow of outmigration dramatically slow down. Um, if we stopped implementing sanctions against Venezuela, Venezuelans would stop leaving. I mean, that's, that's a, again, a statistical fact. We know that they, they was a migrant receiving country before the sanctions. The same is true for any other country that is currently under sanctions. And then for the countries that are not under sanctions, of course, we are intervening in those countries in different ways by, in, uh, you know, imposing anti-democratic measures um, through the international financial institutions, like I mentioned, these are all things that displace people. So if we could not even send aid, if we could just stop um, forcing people to leave their countries and maybe spend some of that money on creating healthcare here in the United States and ensuring that people who have come here as victims of US foreign policy, uh, have their human rights respected and have their right to seek asylum respected, which is not currently the case in that country. I would be happy to see that. I would be delighted to see that. <laughs> I just, I think it's so much money you could transform the whole stinking world, not just this little corner of it. Mm -hmm. Um, we've been speaking with Adrian Pine. She is visiting professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies, Department of Anthropology and Social Change, and co-editor of Asylum for Sale, Profit and Protest in the Migration Industry. Adrian, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks so much for having me, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.